This episode is brought to you by the shows of the You Run Podcast Network, all available at yourunpodcast.com. Whether it's true crime or film reviews, even TV series deep dives, the You Run Podcast Network has you covered. So go and check out yourunpodcast.com today. So Mark is a little bit nervous about some of the topics that may come up when we discuss today's music movie. So I chose a joke that will put him at complete ease for the rest of this episode. <laughs> Man, the possibilities are endless for you here. Please don't fuck this up. Um, what do you call five useless white men sat on a bench? <laughs> I don't know. What do you call five useless white men sat on a bench? The NBA. <laughs> You want to die tonight? The dad jokes he tells sets the scene. I hang on every word lost in the screen. The passion for fear is contagious enough. You make me believe in Mark's overblown roundups. You run podcasts for a movie review. Unveiling facts and playing games too. Your words paint pictures of darkness and dread. Hello and welcome to the You Run Podcast Horror Movie Review. And it's so nice when that plays, I can see Mark's camera and it's been so long since I've seen him bop along. It's amazing. <laughs> I love the new intro music. I think it's fantastic. I, I do as well. We, we had lots of feedback on it as well. Everyone seems to be fully on board with our new heavy thrash metal intro. Yeah, it's a return to form, I feel. I, I definitely feel that. Um, hello, this is the You Run Podcast Horror Movie Review. My name is Scott. My name is Mark. And we're your hosts each and every week as we take you through movies that you voted for on our Instagram page. Uh, you can follow us there at You Run Podcast. Also, while you're there, follow Mark. He's at Reviews from the Crypt and at VHS from the Crypt. He gets very upset if you follow us and not him. So you need to follow him so he doesn't get all upset and Sad. Oh, congratulations to you, by the way. 10K, that's amazing. We have an actual celebrity in our midst nowadays. Uh, honestly, it's been like wild. It went from like five and a half to 10 in two months. That's insane. Because I remember you put that reel out in like January. It's like, let's do a mission, see if we can get to 10K before Christmas. And like, you're there already. I can't believe how quickly that's grown. Yeah, massively fast. And a huge thank you to everyone who's followed us. Because, yeah, it's it's wild like it's wild now because like things have opened up within instagram and i've got access to gifts on reels and all sorts of stuff that i didn't know was there and i was like oh there's like a whole new world of instagram um so yeah well, you, so actually... you have to get like to an elite status to get that kind of like, unlocked it's like unlocking a new level on instagram yeah well, i'll be honest since they put achievements on instagram it has become like a game to me now I've just started doing that, where it's like you have to post like five stories consecutively, consecutively over five days, and they give you like a little PlayStation trophy when you do it. Yeah, so it, it has literally become a new game to me now. I look at what challenge is next and go, that's the one I want, and I work towards <laughs> it. <laughs> the, oh, the only maybe, that, maybe that's the key to the engagement, then, is it? Playing the game. Yeah, the only problem is my next big milestone one is I need a video with 10 million views. That's not unachievable, though, is it not? Some of the reels you've been putting out have been getting like three, four, have they not? Uh, nine and a half is the biggest I've had. So I was close and then it all just died off just before I got it. I was like, damn it. Yeah, but if that bit, if that video gets like momentum again in the next couple of months, would oh, that yeah. still I'll, count towards it? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll still uh, hit it. That, that's anyway, clever, clever. that's enough um, talk about Instagram. Uh, make sure you get in touch with the show. You can do that. Send us an email, yourunpodcast at gmail.com, or you can call us and leave us a video, a, a video, a voicemail. You do that by using the DM feature on Instagram and X, and we have a couple of those this week. Um, also, make sure you leave us a review. Five stars, please. Uh, that really helps the show reach new audiences. Um where do we start? Uh, we have three messages this week. Let's start with Dave B. Movies. 
Hi hey guys, just listening to The Fly. I'll give you my opinions on the new format once I've finished. But to let you know, that Sister Sister are played by Sisters Tia and Tamara, which is also the character names. They just changed the surname for the show. Keep up, catch you next time. Later. There we go. Did he not get feedback for the show? He did, but he messaged me and said, I'm not going to do it in a voicemail because no one wants to hear me talk about what you're doing on the air. I thought he just forgot in the space of that message to leave it. No, he really likes the new format. He's interested to see what interactive features we have as we go forward, which we have a new one today. Our next message is from Becky. Guys, I've just finished listening to your Fly episode and really enjoyed it. Love that film. It's brilliant. I was very happy to be featured in your last ever three word review so thank you very much for including me in that and just wanted to say although other people will probably call in and tell you that yes Tia and Tamara from Sister Sister were real (laughs) twin sisters everyone's very up on their Nickelodeon facts aren't they (laughs) they really really are Uh, was it Nickelodeon or was it Trouble TV it That's was, just going to start a whole new fucking voice message thing. Let's get off that. It was Nickelodeon. I'm sure it was. I'm positive it was right, Nickelodeon. Okay. Uh, that's Becky. She's a Girl and the Gay podcast, one half of the Girl and Gay podcast, part of the You Run podcast network. And Dave B Movies, go and give him a follow on TikTok and on Instagram as well. Uh, last one. This one's from Justin. Hey, Scott and Mark. Justin from Pop Culture Reflections. Love the new format. Loved your conversation about one of my earliest horror memories in the fly and just wanted to uh, comment about your uh, conversation on sister sister they were real twin sisters that is Tia and Tamara Maori so uh, <laughs> yeah, just wanted to confirm that for you and it's a great television show as a uh, guy that grew up in the 90s I loved it a lot recommended highly all right guys great love the show talk to you later Man, people really love Sister Sister, don't they? I was more of my wife and kids kind of guy growing up. Yeah, see, I, I liked Sister Sister, but not to... Uh, I'll be honest, we had more engagement and more messages about Sister Sister than we did about the fly. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so for next week, we're going to be reviewing this. <laughs> I'd do that. Yeah, I know you would. You'd do the whole... <laughs> no, we're not doing that. Uh, 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 we are a movie review show, as I said at the beginning. If you've not listened before or you've not heard any of our new format episodes, we'll give you a synopsis of the movie. We'll tell you what we liked, what we didn't like. We'll talk through various different scenes. Uh, we have interactive features on the show, a brand new one today making its debut called Caption This. Um, we also have facts, then we round up in scores and we let you get on with your day. Um, today we're looking at Jordan Peele's Get Out. So Chris and his girlfriend head up to Rose's parents for the weekend. Um, to start, Chris thinks that the nervous energy around the parents is them trying to stay politically correct and not say anything wrong uh, to, as they navigate the mixed race relationship between him and Rose. But it doesn't take him long to realise that it's far more complicated than that and much darker than he could ever have realised. Um, I'm going to kick this off and say that this is a really boring movie on a rewatch. I When I yeah. first watched this, this was... I remember watching Get Out and being like, holy fuck, this is so good. It's on such another level. It's so deep. It's so meaningful. It looks brilliant. It sounds great. The casting's great. And on this time watching it, because I've seen it already, it didn't have the same impact for me at all. Yeah, and it's not very often I come across a movie that doesn't hold rewatchability as little as this movie did for me and i didn't think i would have that experience going into it i thought oh yeah i really enjoyed this the first time around it was it was refreshing and it was really cool and a, and a unique perspective to take on the kind of horror genre we that kind of horror we've been sort of taking on recently um <clears throat> but this time around i just felt it all fell a little bit flat And I don't think that's necessarily the movie's fault because it is a really good story. But once you know where it goes and how it ends and how it gets there, there isn't a lot in terms of 
stuff in between that makes you go, oh, this bit's coming up next, or this bit's coming up next. It's only your takeaway from the overall movie at the end that you're like, yeah, Get Out was really, really cool. But if you break it down, there isn't a lot here that really makes you go, oh, do you remember that scene in Get Out where they did that? It's just not there. It doesn't have that for me, I don't think. It's a very good story, but it just lacks that overall je ne sais quoi, if you will. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're a podcast <laughs> international podcasting uh, we have we have listeners in, in france who will appreciate what you just said i'm sure um, i'm sure they will there are some bits in this that are like wow moments but none of them are like like for example when you get a wow moment in a nightmare on elm street for example let's take the the scene where johnny depp gets dragged into the bed and blood goes like that scene is so memorable, iconic, is burnt onto my retinas forever, that scene. Yeah. But in this, the scares are so much different and so much more subtle. Like the one the one that I really love, and it's because I can feel the the tension um in the guys is where the where the um uh, is the groundskeeper the gardener is running at night, yeah, and he's sprinted towards him. Like that scene, I'm like, move 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 it don't don't just watch him and then he gets like an inch from him and just turns and runs off the other way like that and i think cool. that's it those are the only characters in this movie that really hold any sort of impact i mean the family themselves as batshit crazy as they are their comeuppance at the end of the movie feels very undercooked and i don't feel like it has enough to it even rose really the way she goes out is a little bit flat the only real impactful scenes in this movie come from the sort of housekeeper characters who have undergone this transition, the moments where they break and start to show themselves a little bit. And you're almost like, well, what the fuck's going on here? And and I think that's down to their performances with these, the delivery of those scenes and it is anything else. I mean, let's, let's just, let's not beat around the bush about this. Let's talk about Jordan Peele as a director, because I feel like this guy is massively overrated personally. And I don't feel like he deserves the status that he seems to have, garnered as being one of the greatest horror directors of this generation he's done like three movies and produced the latest Candyman remake and as far as I'm concerned I don't particularly feel any any of them are worthy of that status let alone especially when you've got people like Ari Aster in the mix and all uh, uh, Alex Garland and all the rest of these other really incredible up-and-coming creative horror directors that we're having at the moment and then all of a sudden this guy gets a title and all he's got to show for it is us get out and nerve. And let's be honest, like you say, watching get out again, not very going on a rewatch. I can imagine us holds the same. I only saw that once. Yeah. I had a great time with the first time round. I thought it was a little bit contrived and a little bit too try hard. And I haven't even given up the time of day. And to be honest with you, from the reception that it's gained, I don't think it deserves the time either. So where are you on Jordan Peele as a director and the current status that he's holding? As an actual director and what he puts to screen and the way he shoots it and some of the shots he uses and the camera angles and the way he lights scenes and the way he actually directs them, he is fantastic. There's no question about it. He is an incredible director. My issues with Jordan Peele lie in he is very much a one trick pony. He uh, and I don't it's mean this in a way, isn't it? Uh, and I don't mean this in a bad way. He 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 gives black cinema this platform that it's never had before, which I think is fabulous. But mm. I also want to see him play away from that. I want to see him go and do something completely different. Whereas at the moment, he is very much, he's done Us, which is very much a a story about black characters and about a black cast interacting with this evil, white, horrible family. And then he's done Us, which again is is centred around black characters. And like I said, I don't have an issue with this. Like I I think it's a really good thing that he does this. But I need to see what he can do outside of this as well. And I've not seen it. I think he's a great director, but I think he is... Like his next movie, I already know the narrative it is going to take. Like I don't know the storyline, but I know there is going to be a very black centric cast telling a story of some sort of oppression. I know there's a message in all of his movies, but I don't necessarily need to see that from him 
every single movie. No, and I think this is half the problem, really, is because when somebody becomes put on such a pedestal, even though they're... Like, I, one thing I found particularly hard to digest with Get Out, if we're going to go down this route and talk about these subjects, is it's very much centred around black people good, white people bad. Racist white A people. white man? Right? And, no! And, and, and I, <laughs> as somebody who has not got a single racist bone in my body, whenever white people are portrayed in this way on screen, I find it so difficult to relate to it and understand the narrative that they're driving. And I'm not saying, I know for a fact that this is a very, very severe pro uh, problem yeah. that needs to be showcased and needs to be addressed. But because I'm not part of it, I find it hard to then see it play out in the way it's done. And I'm like, I don't get it. I don't know people who act like that. I don't, I'm not around people who yeah. behave in this way. The only time I see stuff like that is the way it's portrayed in cinema and on the news. And for, but God I'm, forbid, anybody who has suffered at the hands of this sort of issue, uh, my heart goes out to you. I think it's absolutely atrocious. It's I, just, I, I can't relate to it in a way that it's always presented on screen sometimes. Yeah, and I'm going to say something now that I don't know how well this is going to go down. I mean... If I speak, I am in, in big trouble. But I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I don't think this movie is a racist, a racial-based movie. Yes, it has all of those themes and undertones in it, but they clearly state in this movie, like, it, black is in fashion. That's why all yeah. these people want to become, want their essence or their soul or however you want to put it, their brain parts put into a yeah, black person. yeah and i mean yeah i mean this they do state that in the movie that it is a current trend for this sort of procedure at the moment everybody yeah. wants to be black black is in fashion and obviously that implies that it's not purposely it has... directed at the race it's just that everybody wants to sort of live out life inside a black body at the time yeah which implies that there has been other races that were at height of fashion at the time. There might have been a period where everyone wanted to be Asian or Indian or Russian or yeah. Norwegian or, you know, and, and it's... <laughs> and that's why, did, it's why, at no why at no point did anyone want to be English? I remember. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think that one's that hard to figure out. Uh, um, Gary, but my... Gary, my it, go on, you go, you go. Go on, we're talking over. No, 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 you're yeah. all right. I was just probably going to ramble some nonsense anyway. My brain was going somewhere, but now I've lost it. <laughs> um, one thing I want to ask, though, is the family have the the the, the staff. So they've got the, the uh, housekeeper and they've got the gardener. And I don't like the way they treat them. And the way it's portrayed is that they're that we're told they're friends of the family and they looked after the grandparents and then they were they sort of they yeah. kept them on uh, in reality they are the grandparents but i tell you what though through... mate it was only the second watch that i picked up on that i missed that the first time i saw this film in cinema so did i um, <laughs> um, but all the way through i hate the way they portray the i hate the way that they're portrayed with the white family kind of like overlording them like it, it gave me serious like slave vibes and i know it was meant to yeah it was an supposed audience to, yeah. I, that made me feel super 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 uncomfortable and the family just are the worst like the dad is the sleaziest creepiest weirdest guy ever i we've all been or <laughs> been to meet someone's parents and there's the over enthusiastic dad yeah, he nails it, but my God, it, I just want to crawl into a ball and die for this poor guy. I, I find it. Do you know what's really hard is like I've seen this guy in Brooklyn Nine Nine. He plays Jake Peralta's dad, and every episode where he makes an appearance, <clears throat> he's fantastic. But he's also the same character that he is in this movie. Awfully over enthusiastic, trying to be cool when he's not cool, and he's the same character. So when I was watching him in Get Out, I was like. Uh, it's Detective Peralta's dad being Detective <laughs> Peralta's dad, <laughs> and it was really difficult to separate the two. I think the guy's incredible, and he does a great job in this movie. But for me, just personal attachments, it was hard to separate this time around. Who is the mum? What do I know her from? Because it bugged the shit She's... out of me. I'm gonna probably get this wrong, and people are gonna call in and tell me I'm really, really wrong. But in fact, I already know I'm wrong. I was gonna say it's the mum from Step Brothers, but I know already that it's not. But she's really famous, and she probably had like a massive career. But she just looks different now. But 
Yeah. I, I'm, do you know what? I'm going to Google it now just because I have to yeah. know, and then it'll also save us 16 voice messages next week. <laughs> it won't because they'll ring us up and say, <laughs> why did you have to Google that? Um, it, <clears throat> I've, it's, it's weird that there's something about her I quite like. She is a MILF, and I don't know if that's a common conception or that's uh, just me. Her name's Catherine Keener, probably spelt that wrong. The reason I know her so much is from she's in Being John Malkovich, but she's also the love interest from 40 Year Old Virgin, which is what yes. most people will probably know her from. But she's, yeah, she's got an incredible career. Incredible career. You'll know from hundreds and hundreds of movies if you IMDb her, but most recognizably will probably be being John Malkovich and also the love interest in 40 year old virgin. Yeah, she she is a MILF. She's also an incredible actress. Um, I'm also going to say that if I was Chris, a hundred percent I would be captured and killed by Rose without any difficulty whatsoever. <laughs> you want to come spend the weekend? Yeah, of course. Of course I do. <laughs> I think it's important now while we're on this train is to talk about the casting a little bit. And I think for me, Rose is incredible because she's also got a great career in horror. I think I first discovered her in uh, Perfection, the straight to Netflix movie about the two musicians and then the yeah, end yeah. of like the big whole violin thing at the end. She was fucking creepy as all shit in that. And I think she's brilliant in this, especially the way that she, where she does that switch where she's looking for the keys. Like she, yeah. her whole personality just changes from that point on, and she's just like proper super straight laced mega bitch. Nothing phases her. She puts her hair back in a ponytail. She's like very corporate from that point on, and I think she does that switch so well. Disappointingly, <laughs> we've talked about her already because she's the mum in Megan, and she's crap yes, in that movie. <laughs> she is, and the thing is, I've I've had relationship breakups like that where they're trying to to keep it together. And then when they go, yeah, there's no salvage in this, and the hair goes up, and they're like, yeah, do you know what? Fuck you. Goodbye. And I have like, <laughs> like I'm not going to say who it was, but there's a specific breakup that was very much like that, big breakup in my life. And when I watch this movie, I have flashbacks to that, and I instantly go, you bitch, you absolute <laughs> bitch, I hate you so much. Um, who the who's the standout for you in this movie? It's the mum, like the the hit, no, yeah. The, there's two. It's the mum, and it's also the the guy who's already been done, who he gets with the camera yeah. flash, and he snaps out. Like his performance when he goes from, um, he basically goes from almost like a John Coffey, like Green Mile style character. Yes, yeah, sir, boss. He's very yeah. much like that. He goes from that to fucking run, get the fuck out of here, save me, and then he's taken back in. He's hit like that whole sequence where he has that meltdown after the camera flash and the effects on the eye, just that tiny white flashlight that you could see in his eyes when he stood there is brilliant. And then when they bring him back out and he's so much like, I imagine my, um, I imagine my outburst was quite alarming for you. And I'm like, Oh mate, this is so bad. See, that's one thing as well that I noticed particularly about this rewatch is Obviously, you don't find out this until you get to the end where you realise that they're transplanting in people's consciousness into these bodies. Yeah. But if you watch this movie on a rewatch and you study <clears throat> the people who have already undergone the transition, such as the housekeeper, the groundskeeper, and then this gentleman that we're talking about now who gets captured at the beginning of the movie, you see him get kidnapped and then later on see him as someone yeah. who's playing a game of croquet. Um the, the personalities of the people they're supposed to be representing doesn't necessarily reflect the story narrative. Like, so you have the groundskeeper, for instance, and the housekeeper. They yeah. Their personalities don't reflect the grandparents of the family that they're living with. Their personalities reflect somebody who is a slave working within a very rich house, a white person. Yeah. Again, the, the person who we see at the dinner party who gets a flash, I can't remember the character's name, but he doesn't behave like he is the husband of the wife he stood next to. He behaves like somebody who doesn't belong in the party that he's at. And yeah, it's like, see, this is something that I questioned and I didn't know how much of that was the people within these bodies using these bodies as basically like puppets. I didn't know if that was them trying to play a role for Chris because Chris is there to be lured in and captured and i didn't know if this was them playing that role because when you get to the end with uh 
Rose is in the road with Chris and the granddad comes up and she says, get him. He is different in personality to what he was earlier. He's very much more aggressive and he pins him down like you're going to die. Like it's very, it's a very different character. So I don't know if they were just playing the parts they were given. Um, I just think but, it's down to start a poor writing, to be honest with you. I think it was misleading. It was done in a misleading purpose. <clears throat> and I get, again, when you watch it for the first initial time, it works in that way. But on a rewatch, when you get to the end and you know the actual result of these characters and you know who they're trying to be, that part of the writing fall apart, falls apart for me slightly. Because I don't feel like yeah. it's intentional. I don't feel like they're putting on a persona for Chris's sake because if they were, they wouldn't be acting as something from a history book do you know what i mean yeah. they would be more natural and more accepting of the situation and free-flowing to try and make him feel comfortable to lure him in instead if anything they just warn him away a little bit and make him more apprehensive of being around them and i think for me that's where it falls apart slightly on a rewatch yeah see the one thing i do really appreciate about this movie and i like and i think it's very very clever is the bait and switch with the all the way through, you think that it is it, it, they're slaves. You think that they're luring Chris in, they're going to hypnotize him, and he's going to become a slave. <laughs> yeah, like slaves. a worker around the house. Yeah. <laughs> who um, is but, that um, who makes that comment? <laughs> I have slaves. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, like I I like the fact that they lead you into that, even to the point there's a bit there with an auction where it, Chris is off that talking cool. to Rose after he's had a meltdown and they've got all these people at the party and the dad's leading a silent auction where they've all holding up bingo cards and he's just putting fingers up. No words, just three, four, five, ten. And it's the blind man who buys Chris. And I'm like, yeah, shit, they, they've just sold him. Like they're going to hypnotize him now and he's going to go off and be a slave. When I get the reveal of actually it's not that, like with a bit where Chris is trapped in the room and yeah. he has the telephone conversation on the TV with the guy who's bought it, who explains exactly what's happening. That was a real fuck. Okay. Yeah. So um, he gives uh, a big exp exposition dump about the whole situation and how, how it's not because he's black. He just wants his eyes and, and all the rest of it. Yeah. And what do you think about the whole hypnotism thing in this? Do you, so I've I've been and seen a few hypnotists and I got pulled on stage once and I can't be hypnotized or the hypnotist couldn't hypnotize me. Well, uh, no one can it's not real. Well, you can be put into a state of hypnosis. That's not phony. I've, I've we seen don't need it. to have this conversation, mate. It's yeah. not real. It's the same thing as psychics. We, we, let's not do this because <laughs> you know where I stand on psychics. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's it's only uh, let's say it does exist to it does, but let's say it does exist to appease you. Um <laughs> there's only certain people who can be put under. You need to have a suggestible mind to basically succumb to these reasonings and this new way of thinking. And they talk about that where she's saying there's lots of little things they do with suggestions. She's doing the the thing with the teacup where she keeps staring at it and making the clink, and that's to to get him in that mindset. Now, if that doesn't work with everyone, I want to know the stories of when they've kidnapped people, tried it, and they couldn't put them under. And we don't get that in this. It's just like everyone can be hypnotized. <laughs> I don't buy it. I don't buy into that. Well, I don't think that's. I don't think that's necessarily the case because I think they do do an actual. I think they do do a pretty good job of establishing that because they put him under initially to cure him from his smoking. So I feel like that's more a case of her testing to see if he is susceptible, if it is real, and we are doing it for the sake of the narrative of the story it's more a case of testing they're using one of his it's almost like a habit they even have a conversation at the table about habits and stuff like that or you should see rose she'll be able to cure you with that and i feel like maybe that that part of it is is his initiation test is like oh well we'll see if we can put him under and then that way if we know we can put him under to cure his smoking which again works because after that he says the thought of having a cig makes me feel sick at this point um, yeah and I feel like so maybe at that point they'll probably keep things more natural, free flowing. If they've got a habit, they'd maybe do a situation where Rose tries to put them under to cure his habit. If it doesn't work, they play it cool, they carry on, they leave, she then breaks up with them, they go on to the next victim. Yeah. Uh, and that's a cool thing in this as well. Like the bit where Chris realizes everything's a bit fucked up 
And he says to Rose, we've got to go. And she plays the part. She's like, yeah, okay, fine. I'll pack the bags. Let's get everything. And he goes in that cupboard and he finds all the photographs of all of the other people that she's brought here, including the guy who's already the hypnotized. Gardener. Yeah, like that is like, wow. Like, so such a like mind fuck moment. And but even then, why does the... he not leave on his own? Why is he still like, come on, Rose, where's the keys? We need to get the fuck out of here. I feel like that was a poor judgment on his part. Like he surely at that point, he must have known that she's in on it. Yet he's still, I mean, I don't know. Is he necessarily, he just wants the keys from her. But that oh. switch, man, when she does that, where she's rooting around in the bag and pulls them out. It's like these ones in her face, man. It's so cool. Uh, and the bit then when she sat in her room with her hair up in a ponytail, eating Fruit Loops and drinking milk and searching online for her next victim, it's like, oh, wow. It's actually an NBA player. <laughs> it <looks> so cold. <laughs> um, yeah. I want to talk about the friend because he is the highlight. So Jordan Peele is excellent at writing comedy. There's no yeah. question about that. He is, as far as I'm concerned, that is his wheelhouse and horror is like his adopted home. And this guy who's Chris's friend says all the stuff that we're all thinking, like from the off, he's like, you you, you don't want to be going to her, her parents' house. Like they, they, they got slaves and shit out there. Like he says it straight yeah. away. And then, yeah. and then like, and then like when Chris is calling him, he's going like, it's a bit weird. He's I'm fucking telling you, man, they're going to turn you into a sex slave. You let her hypnotize you. What the fuck is wrong with you? Like he's great. And his crowning Brilliant. moment for me is when he goes to the police. I was crying. That's heart. good. When he's like, is it like TVA? Or, not TVA. That's from He's the um, TSA. Yeah. TSA the, or something um, like that. And he's like, you're trying to like, wave his badges if he's authority because he's airport <laughs> security and stuff. It's just hilarious. And like you said, Jordan Peele is a comedy. He's a comedy actor. He does sketch comedy with Keenan something, something. The guy who does yeah. loads of voice over work these days. Um, that is his wheelhouse. And the thing about this movie is it starts off very much like it's going to be a horror comedy, Do you know, with the guy mm -hmm. who's getting abducted and he's having that talk with himself and he's like a black guy in the wrong neighborhood. And he's like, yeah, not tonight. This ain't happening to a brother. And yeah. all of a sudden he gets kidnapped. And I'm like, this is going to be great. This is going to be really funny. It's going to have that real dark edge to it. But then that just stops apart from when you get those breaks with his best friend. Yeah. And again, you kind of get it come in slightly at the end of the movie when he picks him up and he's like covered in blood and he's like I'm just going to say it man I told you not to go in that house yeah. <laughs> and it just broke me I was like yeah that's brilliant that's the kind of thing you would say to me in that situation 100% um, that's exactly what through my head like I'd pick you up caked in blood you'd get in and the first words out of my mouth was like I, I told you not to why, why did you yeah. <laughs> I told you not to press a red button. Um, and and that's great. And I, and I feel like that would have amplified this movie a lot more had he incorporated a little bit more of that humour. And, and it's a really difficult thing to balance is horror and comedy. And not just horror and comedy, a lot of, horror, a lot of genres and comedy. Like yeah. Marvel, they really struggle with it to try and implement it perfectly. But I feel like if anybody could do it, it would be Jordan Peele. And yeah. that's one of the most disappointing things of us. I feel like that lacked any comedy at all in that movie, barring that one particular scene where the Alexa goes off and they're in yeah. the cabin and the doppelgangers come in and they have the big fight off with um, the girl from Invisible Man. That has a, like a comedic undertone to it. And that's a great scene. Had the rest of the movie been on a similar sort of balance and vibe, it would have been perfect. Um, so I don't know. I hope in future he realizes that he doesn't need to just be this dark message sending horror director and he incorporates what he's good at because he is very good at it and it shows in this movie. Yeah. And I'd also like him to focus a little bit more on the kills. Like I know this movie is not a movie that's focused on kills, but every single one of the kills is incredibly <laughs> underwhelming. So you've got the brother who we've yeah. not spoken about yet. Who's an absolute arsehole. Um, he comes to get Chris for his procedure and he gets killed with a croquet ball and it's kind of underwhelming. And then Chris, well, comes his second out. kill is better when he gets rock stomped when he turns back up uh, later on. Yeah. See, that's better. But again, you don't see it. It's off camera. It's behind a wall. It's off camera. You're right. It is. Uh, and then the dad then, as well, the biggest overseer of the situation, as cool as a kill is in theory, he gets antlered to a wall. It's like yeah. a split second kill and it doesn't, there is no conversation and dialogue between um, 
what's his name? Not the dad, the guy, the Chris. main character. Chris. Chris. There's no dialogue between Chris and the dad in that moment. There should be like this whole back and forth between the two of them, even for an Obama joke there, oh, just for 100%. the kick. Of it. Like, you know, like if they'd have come full circle with the Obama thing and had that there and had a really yeah, gory, like, gruesome kill, that would have been brilliant. Yeah, like you could have had Chris in that moment go, oh, by the way, I didn't vote for Obama, and then pin him to a wall. Yeah, <laughs> that, that would have been brilliant. You know, just something like that, but it just is quick, it's underwhelming. And again, the mother, like the matriarchy of the situation, like she's a mega bitch all the way throughout this. And yeah. like she was the one who I wanted to see get it the most. And again, she stabs Chris in the hand with the knife, he pushes it back against her, but he pushes her off camera and you just hear like a squelch as if to say, like, has he pushed it into her face or what? I mean, it's cool in theory. Again, cool in theory because the knife's still in his hand and he's killed her with the knife that's stuck in his hand. So he's like pushed his hand onto her head or something because you see yeah. him then walk off and back onto camera, take the, knife, the knife out and in. drop it on the floor. And again, then we get to Rosie's kill. She gets shot, falls to the floor. He doesn't even finish her off. And then just leaves and she just dies on the side of the road. And it's like, oh, like this was, I think the problem I have with this as well is had there been substance throughout in terms of more horror centric stuff, gore, kills, etc., I would have accepted such a mediocre kill spree at the end. But because we'd been spending yeah. two hours and 10 minutes of a build up to get to this moment, it doesn't feel like he's got his comeuppance his revenge his reward for having to endure this situation like this should no. have been his moment i know he walks off covered in blood but he should have been like evil dead style covered in blood and and having a massacre behind him yeah and all of the characters who died deserved much more gruesome much more aggressive deaths than they got and i know there's an element he wanted to ground this quite a bit in reality but you can't ground it in reality and then in the same breath kill someone with a deer head antler charging down a hallway like is yep. that balance again is not not right for me um one of the best things that i did like though in terms of deaths is when the grandfather even though it's not the grandfather in this instance he kills himself yeah like he, he so he gets the flash camera he snaps back into who he is he turns around to rose and says Give me the gun. I want to be the one to kill him. But actually, it's he's back to his normal self now. He gets the gun. He shoots Rose, and she falls down. And then he turns the gun on himself, like yeah. he's suffered. What do they call that place where they go to? Like the surface level, or the, the Can, sunken, sunken place? The sunken place. Yeah, he's like, what have you endured? How long have you been in that sunken place to make you really wanna? What have you seen? What have you been through to to? know that there's nothing going forward or is it because it's a fear of it happening again like is it going to walk down the street and see a light switch or and he's going to revert back to it like i want to know what his motives were for doing that was it because of what he's seen or because of the fear of it happening again because yeah, to take your own life man you've got to have some some serious reasoning to want to do that yeah you do and like the, the concept of the sunken place again is really good that concept of being able to see and hear and feel everything that's going on, but have no control over it. That is a terrifying concept, but they don't utilize it enough. Like I want to see, they don't, no. I want to, I want to see, like I want to see inside the guy who snaps out of it midway through. I want to see inside him when he gets put back in there. I want to see his sheer terror and like, fuck no i don't want to be back in here please let like that's what i want i want to see more of that uh, and the thing I, is I as well i feel like that could have been represented in a really good way because the moment that chris goes first under and you see him fall backwards into his chair and he falls through into the sunken place as if he's going through water yeah and as as he's looking up you see it's almost like he's looking through a tv screen he's watching his life unfold through a tv screen like you could have represented that really well by having the flash and then seeing the guy come back up through the sunken place into his own body and then again get pulled back through it. Like you could have done it because they have, they've shown how well it looks when they do represent it. So again, you're right. That, that is a massive, massive underwhelming element of it that should have been utilized better. Yeah. Should we take a break? Sure thing. After this episode, why not check out the Paranormal Misfits podcast? Hosted by Chrissy and Nino, this show looks at everything paranormal. 
conspiracy theories, murder. They also do reviews into horror movies too. This show has it all. Also available on the You Run Podcast Network, the horror-friendly podcast hosted by Charlie, Katie and Chantel. This hilarious review podcast covers movies from the past, the present and everything else in between. You do not want to miss this great addition to the You Run Podcast Network. And all of these shows and many more are all available at yourunpodcast.com. We have a new feature. I'm okay. excited. I don't do know, you know what the what new is? feature is. Oh, do I? You do. It's cap- caption this. Oh, yeah, I do know what it is. Of course I do. I'm in the loop. You, you, I work hard behind yeah. the scenes. <laughs> um, so for anyone who's watching, uh, this works really well. So if you're watching on Spotify or if you're watching this on YouTube about three weeks after its release in its heavily edited form, um, you will be able to see this image. So this is the image that we asked you to caption. People did not disappoint. It Excellent. is not the roaring riding train that three word reviews became. But for a first outing, we got a lot of interaction. So thank you, everyone who, who gave us a caption for this. Uh, we're going to start on X with Justin from Pop Culture Reflections. Um, you think you could do that Christopher Walken impression one more time? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> it works great. Uh, um, on Instagram, uh, Mark's Arch Nemesis, uh, Randomly Eric. Let me get this straight. I sit in the corner and just watch. <laughs> I like this, man. This is a good feature. <laughs> it is very good. Uh, the BMB podcast. So, wait, it's a podcast about horror movies? <laughs> and they are a, a movie podcast. Uh, we got Dewey Pod Monster. Um, <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to make love to your mother. <laughs> uh, we, brilliant we got a couple of more uh ahsfx memes this is american horror story memes page we saw you from across the bar we really dig your vibe <laughs> what is that a quote you, from I, I don't know it's uh it's uh it's something that's you get in like swingers do that don't they, they yeah see i've seen it used in movies before and stuff as well but it definitely does give that vibe that picture uh, have you ever had that have you ever had a couple approach you and go would, would you like to be part of that we like the look of you you strike no. me as the sort of guy you, you're covered in tattoos you're a bit sort of gruff and you live your life on a roof <laughs> a lifting gruff. bricks. Around. you live on a roof lifting <laughs> bricks around you strike me as the sort of person who a couple having a renovation is like, would you like to come and look in the bedroom? You see, the thing is, with my job, you always talk about that at work between fellow work friends. It's like it's it's a topic of conversation. It's like, what would you do? What would you do if you went to a house and you was uh, and you get those sort of weird things where it's like, I haven't got any money to pay you, but I'm sure I could pay you in another way. And it's like, <laughs> how would you deal with that situation? Um so that is a conversation I have quite regularly at work. However, the whole swingers thing, it's difficult, isn't it? Because there's two people and you have to treat your own response worried about how they're going to respond to your response. So you have to do that sort of look as if to say, are you going to answer this first or am I going to answer this first? Because my answer can go one or two ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah see i i'm gonna say now i'm definitely not for the swing of life like that's not for, i'm not into share i don't share anything with anyone ever <laughs> it depends whether you're going in with an upgrade if you're being approached with an upgrade offer <laughs> it kind of puts you <laughs> in a bit of a catch-22 doesn't it <laughs> we're gonna carry my wife doesn't season. listen to this show don't worry <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I may release this soundbite and tag her for the <laughs> oh i'm only messing i'm only messing i don't mean it i don't mean it at all i love my wife very very much this is a show <laughs> we're here for comedy i um, no i would ne- i never would personally i never would i wouldn't like and it's not because i wouldn't want to it's because i don't feel like i would like the idea of somebody else interfering with my wife no I'm if i was single Maybe with the couples thing. I don't know. I could maybe go go with that. Do the whole sit in the corner and watch thing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 
Evron138, let me tell you about Scientology. And they're a horror movie addict. And the last one, uh, which is, I, I shouldn't pick favourites, but this is my favourite because it's so clever in its reference. Uh, this is from Salvage Horror. And it was at that point I lost the contest to Billy Madison. So now you understand the hatred I behold for him. Because <laughs> he was the guy oh, Billy Madison goes against in the contest. Yeah. His dad plays that character. I, I love that. Uh, thank you, everyone, for that new feature. Uh, we'll, we'll tweak that as we go along and we'll get it more refined. And we've got more features coming. Uh, they're not going to be on every episode, but we have got lots of them coming. Let's do some facts. Uh, yes. Jordan said the title um he named it get out because this is something that he would often he'd go to the cinema and he'd sit there and he'd hear black audience members because in america everyone shouts at the screen which i still find weird but he was he said it was always be black audience members who would shout get out get out and it stuck with him so when he got the chance to do this that was always going to be the title before he even had the script together that's what it was called that's interesting because when you watch the movie and you see that scene play out where he gets flashed with the camera and that's all he screams is get out get out get out i just assumed the title came after the movie like they must no, have had like a working title and then they saw that scene and was like you know what that's what we're going to call this film no the title was there first and that come everything else was born after it um the opening of the film is a direct homage to 1978's halloween in the way it was shot the scene, yeah. the, te the the street that he picked, the angles that he shot from, that was pure. He wanted to have a go at being John Carpenter, and I really appreciate the opening scene. It's really well done. Yeah, and the thing is as well, I know we've sort of had our conversations about Jordan Peele on this episode, but he is a genuine horror fan. Like, he yeah, loves oh, horror. Massive. Probably yeah. more than he enjoys comedy, regardless of how great he is at that. He loves horror movies. Yeah, which kind of takes me out of my next fact but hey uh, jordan peele is a prankster and a comedian on set um he would often direct scenes doing impersonations of other people including forrest whitaker and barack obama so he would direct a scene <laughs> as barack obama or he'd direct a scene as forrest whitaker which fucking brilliant like yeah, how how as a, as a cast member how do you keep a straight face when he's being barack obama like how you have to imagine he has a good working environment to be part of. Like, yeah, given the type of character he is, like, you have to imagine he's he's got a very cool, cool sort of working relationship with his cast and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I imagine he's a great director to work with, and I've got nothing against Jordan Peele. I think every interview I've seen, every time I've seen him talk about movies, he's passionate and he truly believes like everything he's putting out, he's putting everything into it. He's not half in everything. I just don't think yeah. all of his movies land for me. Um, <laughs> we nearly had a different Chris. And I'll be honest, I kind of want the version of the movie where Eddie Murphy plays Chris. He's way too old to play this role. It would have been the whole cast would have had to have been a generation older in order to accommodate Eddie Murphy in this role. I mean, who's the guy who plays Chris? I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name either, but he's great. He's a British actor. He's a British actor. He's fantastic. I first saw him in a TV series. I talk about these guys all the time. The League of Gentlemen. So it's Rishi Smith and Steve Pemberton. They do Inside Number 9. But before they did Inside Number 9, they had a TV series in between League of Gentlemen and Inside Number 9 called Psychoville, which ran for two series in the UK. And he was, <clears throat> he was one of the lead characters in Psychoville. Um, he he helped. He was like an assistant to this blind man who had like this weird secret room in his house, and it turned out to be his collection of Beanie Babies. Fantastic, oh. just pure comedy gold. Um, it doesn't sound it when I explain it that way, but if you get the chance, go and watch Psycho. Though it's very horror centric. It's got this whole creepy clown in it that's like Pennywise. You've got Dawn French, a lot of other fantastic British actors in it. But he got his first initial breakout in acting in that TV series. And he was so good at it. But then for me, <clears throat> seeing him in such a low, a low level British comedy sitcom. And then the next thing I saw him in was in Jordan Peele's Get Out as a main character. And he's gone on to have a fantastic career in Hollywood. I see him popping up all the time at the moment. Um, yeah, he's just some young teenager from London who's just had a massive success in Hollywood. And I think he deserves it because he's fantastic in this movie. Yeah, he, is. he really, really is. But 
seeing Eddie Murphy take on that role would have been an entirely different movie altogether. And the reason he didn't get it is because they decided he was too old and they had to up all yeah. the ages of the cast so they didn't do it. Um, oh, I do know what I'm talking about sometimes. <laughs> you do. Um, you know the bit at the beginning where they get pulled over going to the, the, the parents' house? They get pulled over. And yes. Rose convinces the police officer not to get their IDs and it's kind of like she just kind of pushes it all away. It was yeah. only on this rewatch that I realised she wasn't doing that for Chris's benefit or because it was anything to do with race. She was doing that out of pure self-preservation because she didn't want the cop having her ID and Chris's ID because then they would be a link to where he disappeared and who he was with. I never even realised that. That is actually really, really clever. I thought it was just her just trying to show how pro-black she is. And like yeah. she's like, no, no, man, you don't have to show him your ID. You haven't done anything wrong, which in essence is right. There is no reason oh, for him to have to show his ID to the police officer in that situation. He only asked for it because he was black. Yeah. Which is very apparent. Um, however, yeah, I thought that was the reason. I thought she was just defending his honor, but now you express it like that. I'm like, yeah, of course. There's a perpetrator yeah. if he gives his ID. It, exactly. If they get Selfish his ID bitch. and her ID and then check the number plate, when Chris evidently goes missing in about two weeks' time, yeah, they're going to put his name into a database. Go, oh, he was pulled over here with this person. Let's go talk to her. And I thought that was like spotting it this time. I was like, that's really clever. There's been a, so much thought into that. And again, it's a misdirect. It's a misdirect to making us think it's something when actually it's something completely different. Really, really cool. Uh, there is a cameo in this from Jordan Peele, um, and it's his voice. Uh, it's a voice that says, a mind is a terrible thing that goes to waste. Um, he also provides the sound of the dying deer when it gets hit by the car. That's Jordan Peele's not <laughs> Jordan Peele makes the noise of the dying deer. Where does he say the quote, a mind is a terrible thing to waste? It's a, towards the end of the movie. It's when he's sinking into the sunken place or the, the downward place or whatever it's called. Um, it's, it's a, a voiceover. Um, I think that's about it for this. I, I'm going to take roundups on this first. And despite the things I've criticised throughout this movie, I'm probably going to surprise people by a roundup. I found this very dull as a rewatch, but I can also appreciate how well this is made. I can appreciate how well this is cast, how well this is shot. And I also appreciate the message that's within it because it is a very important message that there is this oppression of black people that is not right and it's it's highlighted in this but it's highlighted in a way that it's not rammed down your throat and i think he handles it very very subtly and i think he does a very very good job i like the story i would love to see this story fleshed out a bit better there's lots of things in this that i don't think are dragged as far as they could or worked as much as they could. I'd also like to see a longer period at the beginning where everything is okay because everything's not okay from the second he gets there and you're kind of, the whole movie you feel awkward and like, oh, fucking hell, you, you are just, like you want the ground to swallow Chris up all the way through and you don't have like any time of levity or any time to catch your breath in this it is very much an oppressive movie that makes you feel uncomfortable and it makes you feel just ugh, and I, I don't like that um it's a good movie it's not a movie i'd revisit very often but i can't take anything away from it it's, it's a 3.5 out of 5 for me solid scores um i mean you've said everything pretty much that i would have said in my roundup i'll be honest with you i mean i think direction wise is is it's flawless. There isn't a lot of part that I could pick apart here and say, oh, that's a bit wonky. Maybe the CGI deer at the beginning, but that would probably be my only criticism in the filmmaking side of things overall. Um, I think narratively, the story moves very well at a progressive pace. I have no issues with that. It all flows very well. You're right. It's not necessarily a standardized horror movie in terms of the way everything unfolds, it, it plays on a different beat and it pulls on a different string in terms of what kind of horror movie it is. It's more built on constant, consistent tension and yeah. anxiety, which there is a market for. There is people out there who like these types of horror movies, and I do. 
I like them on an initial watch. And when I initially watched this movie, I thought it was fantastic. But it doesn't hold that same value on a rewatch for me, especially this time around. This is the second time I've seen it since it came out. And I don't feel like it had that same gripping atmospheric tone to it because I already knew where it was going. So, yeah, and I, I think to get a movie that is a tension based movie and to give it rewatchability, it has to be on such an elevated level. Like something yeah. like The Shining, that is yeah. very much a tension filled movie. And every time I watch it, I feel that tension and I feel that uncomfortableness. And this rewatch for this, I didn't get it like I got it first time. Like it was so much watered down that I was kind of a bit like, meh. That's and a perfect like, way to describe it is watered down because when you look at the films like The Shining that you're comparing it to, The Shining, although it holds that same level of tension throughout, it has those rhythmic beats of memorable scenes. So you'll get yeah. this tension consistently throughout, but then you'll get this break where you've got a scene like we talked about with The Nightmare on Elm Street, although this is a very different movie and The Shining is a very different movie to A Nightmare on Elm Street, but it, you've got the scenes where it's boom, that's an iconic scene. That's going to be talked about. That's going to be remembered. And when I rewatch yeah. this movie, I'm going to be excited to get to that particular scene. This movie doesn't do that. It holds, it holds the atmosphere and the tension consistently throughout, but it doesn't give us those rhythmic beats throughout to be able to be like, yes, when I go back and watch this, I can't wait to get to that scene. I can't wait yeah. to get to the scene after that. So you can tolerate the tension throughout. Um, so for me, it felt really, really flat on a rewatch. It really did. And that's disappointing because I know how much I enjoyed it the first time I watched it. Um, I'm not going to dive too much into the racial implications of what this movie is trying to represent because, again, I don't feel qualified to pass my 10 pence worth on it. I don't feel like it's something that I'm um, experienced enough to be able to say, yeah, this is this, this and that, because I'm not. I've not lived it. I don't know. And I'm certainly not qualified to tell you how it is or how it isn't. This movie is certainly going to land and mean more to some people than it is to others. And unfortunately, I'm just not one of those people who people who are in that that kind of environment to understand the message to a certain level that it's trying to represent. Um, yeah. I think Jordan Peele's a great director. I really do. I think he's had a fantastic run of movies visually. I just think he falls flat on his narrative. And I can't remember what it was that we spoke about recently. It must have been like three episodes ago. What have we said where we're like, he's fallen into that Rob Zombie-esque uh, thing where he's back into the Max, same thing? Maxine, Maxine yeah, Ty West. Week. Ty West, yeah. yeah, Ty West. Jordan Peele is getting in his Ty West mode and he, again, is going to fall victim to the fact that if he doesn't switch up things differently soon, it's going to be one of those, oh, it's another Jordan Peele movie. So, so what I don't saying? want that for him. So what you're saying is we need to go fund me for Rob Zombie, Ty West and Jordan Peele to get them a new writing team. Exactly, exactly that. And I just think you need to, unless you're somebody who has a particular, I don't know, like, like yeah, Jordan Peele has now got himself in a niche. Yeah. But his niche isn't something that I'm necessarily drawn to. David Cronenberg has a niche when he makes movies but that's a niche that I'm drawn to. It's a body horror element of stuff. You know, I'm not saying directors don't deserve to have a niche, but I feel like the kind of niche that we're getting from some of these newer directors is becoming so overplayed and unrefreshing every time something comes out. It's going to be an eye roll after four, five or six movies down the road that the box office numbers for them are going to drop and that they're not going to get the investment to make movies that they deserve to make because all of them are incredible directors. They just need to keep something a little bit fresh. Ari Aster, I know I've spoke about him already on this episode, but he is one of those directors where Midsummer and um, Hereditary. Hereditary, very contrasting movies, visually both exceptional but they both take the narrative in completely different directions. And I think he is a director where I'm like, I can't wait to see what this guy does next. And Jordan Peele has the potential to be that guy if he switches up his narrative a little bit and does something outside of his normal wheelhouse to the point where we don't know what's going to come from him next. But at this moment in time, I know what kind of movie Jordan Peele's going to no. make next. And I don't know whether I want to see it. <laughs> 
yeah, like it, a prime example would be Jordan Peele's. His next movie comes out, I think it's Christmas twenty five or Christmas twenty six. He's making a Christmas movie. Like, give us a balls to the wall, crazy ass slasher, and yeah. just leave every, like because Jordan Peele's very good at not telling you what he's making. Like, don't tell anyone what you what you're making. Everyone turns up expecting us or get out or nope, they're expecting another one of those. And you give us a full on gore fest slasher movie with like a massacre scene of fifty people being taken down by a masked assailant, and you will leave audiences jaws on the floor. Like you'll leave yeah. people stunned. And then people are like, man, have you seen that new Jordan Peele movie? And everyone's like, oh, is it like Get Out? And us and like, no, man, go see it. He's completely different. He's just got some dude killing the shit out of everyone on a Christmas dinner. Exactly. exactly. That This is it. And I think that's kind of what's missing from these directors. They make one successful movie and then that's kind of, they think they need to replicate that from there on out in their career. And they don't because what they make next, regardless of how different it is, it will find an audience. You know, everything's going to find an audience, whether it's a success, as successful as the first movie they've made or more successful. It, time will tell, but just, Keep it fresh. Change it up. Do you know what I mean? Don't get stuck in that narrative. So for me, anyway, I'm rambling on. My roundup score is going to be a three, and I think a three is generous. I loved this movie when it came out. It was cool. It was different. But on a rewatch, it really doesn't hold up well. And that's not because it's dated. It's just because I know exactly where it's going to go. And I've watched movie. <clears throat> I've watched some films like, probably 50, 60 times over. I don't even tell you how many times I've watched John Carpenter's Halloween, but I can still watch that movie back to back over and over again. I could never do that with this movie. No, no, I agree. Well, that's us wrap for another episode. Uh, we're going to be back next week. Uh, next week we are taking on a movie that doesn't necessarily sit in the horror genre, but fuck it. It's our show and it's your show and you voted it on. So it's officially a horror movie. Um, but until then, make sure you leave us a review wherever you can. Go and follow us on our social medias, which I gave you earlier. Have a wonderful week and we will catch you all next time. See you all later. Cheers, guys. See you next week. You want to die tonight? Overblown roundups. You only broadcast for a movie review. Unveiling facts and playing games too. Your words paint pictures of darkness and dread, leaving me grinning long after I fled. You run podcast for a movie review. Unveiling facts and playing games too. Your words. Pictures of